Last time, we were able to construct a large family of finitely additive measures with the aid of semi-algebras. Let's review for a moment. A semi-algebra is a collection of subsets of the sample space, which contains the empty set, is closed under finite intersection, and is almost closed under complement. The complement of any set in the semi-algebra is required to be a finite disjoint union of elements from the semi-algebra. The canonical example, the one motivating all of this for us of a semi-algebra is the collection of all half open intervals in the real line, including the full real line, for example, which is the interval from minus infinity up to infinity closed because for us intervals are always contained in the real line. This semi-algebra of intervals generates as a sigma field the full Borel sigma field of the real line. But the field that it generates, which is all we need to consider when we're interested in finitely additive measures and premeasures, where we're heading, is exceedingly simple, thanks to the proposition that we proved last time. If S is any semi-algebra, then the algebra or field generated by that semi-algebra consists simply of all finite disjoint unions of elements from S. And so the field generated by this semi-algebra of half open intervals consists of all finite disjoint unions of half open intervals. And we refer to that as the Borel field in this context. With that in hand, we saw how it is always straightforward to construct finitely additive measures on an algebra generated by a semi-algebra, provided that we can construct a finitely additive function on the semi-algebra itself. That is, if we have any function chi, which is additive over finite disjoint unions of elements from the semi-algebra, then it automatically extends to a finitely additive measure on the algebra generated by that semi-algebra on the collection of disjoint unions. And the way it extends is more or less clear. It has to be this way. The finitely additive measure chi of a disjoint union of elements from the semi-algebra must be equal to the sum of the finitely additive measures of the pieces in that disjoint union. The only tricky part is to verify that this formula is well defined since any particular set in the semi-algebra can be decomposed as a finite disjoint union probably in many different ways. And we just need to make sure that this formula will give the same value no matter which decomposition we choose, which was the last thing that we proved in this context last time. And so that allows us to construct finitely additive measures on, for example, this Borel field, so long as we can construct finitely additive functions in this sense, which we proceeded to do as follows. We start with a putative cumulative distribution function, a term which we will formally define soon, any non-decreasing function on the reals, and we define the following function on half open intervals. Chi of the interval from a up to b is just f at b minus f at a, motivated by, for example, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we proved last time that this is a finitely additive function on the semi-algebra of half open intervals, which means by the last proposition that it extends to a finitely additive measure on the Borel field, the field generated by the semi-algebra of half-open intervals consisting of finite disjoint unions of half-open intervals. Great. Our next goal is to show that those finitely additive measures are actually countably additive on the field generated by the half-open intervals. Unfortunately, that's just not always true. As we saw, the finitely additive measure generated by this function is not countably additive if the function fails to be right continuous at any point, as we proved. Today, 
we are going to prove, thankfully, the converse, which is that provided that function f is right continuous on the real line, then in fact, the finitely additive measure induced by this formula is actually countably additive on this Borel field. And therefore, we have constructed a large family of premeasures, countably additive measures on the field of disjoint unions of half open intervals. In order to prove this, we're going to first prove one more happy reduction from the level of the field to the level of the semi-algebra, as for example, in this case, the semi-algebra of half open intervals. Suppose that we have constructed a finitely additive function on the semi-algebra, and so we now know that it extends to a finitely additive measure on the field generated by that semi-algebra. The fact is that that finitely additive measure is actually countably additive, is a premeasure, if and only if it is countably subadditive on just the semi-algebra itself. In other words, all we need to verify is that if we have any set in the semi-algebra, a half open interval, and we decompose it as a countable disjoint union of elements in the semi-algebra, half open intervals, then the finitely additive measure of that set E is no bigger than the sum of the finitely additive measures of the pieces. That's what we need to prove, and let's prove it now. So the forward direction here is quite immediate. Premeasures are countably additive on the full algebra, and therefore they're countably additive on the subset S, and therefore they're certainly countably subadditive. For the converse, well, in fact, as we showed in a previous lecture, finitely additive measures are always halfway there to being countably additive. In particular, they're always countably super additive. And so it suffices to prove that this finitely additive measure is countably subadditive on the field, on the algebra generated by S. So that's what we need to do. We need to take any A in the field that is a countable disjoint union of elements in the field and show that chi of A is less than or equal to the sum of the chi of the ANs. Now what we know is that chi of E is less than or equal to the sum of the chi of the EJs, where E, J, and E are sets in the semi-algebra. Of course, what we should do is decompose A and AN in terms of the semi-algebra, where they came from. Since A and AN are in the algebra, that means each of them is a finite disjoint union of sets from the semi-algebra. Let's decompose A in terms of these sets EJ, and let's decompose AN as a disjoint union with a number of terms that depends on little n of some sets EIN. Okay, so let's take this identity here and take the intersection with EJ. Well, EJ intersected with A is just EJ because EJ is one of the pieces of the disjoint union A. And so what we get is that EJ is equal to the union over N of AN intersected with EJ, thanks to De Morgan's laws. And now, Let's take AN and decompose it into its pieces in the semi-algebra. So this becomes the union over N, the sum over I equals one up to N sub little n of EIN intersected with EJ. And note that this intersection 
is in S because the semi-algebra S is closed under finite intersections. Therefore, we have here a countable disjoint union of elements in the semi-algebra. And by assumption, our finitely additive measure, chi, is countably subadditive over disjoint unions in the semi-algebra. Therefore, chi of ej is less than or equal to the sum over n and the sum over i of chi of that intersection. Now I'm going to sum on j. So the sum of chi of ej is less than or equal to the sum over j n and i of chi of the intersection of EIN with EJ. Now on the left hand side, by the finite additivity of the finitely additive measure chi, this sum is just equal to chi of A thanks to that decomposition. On the right, I'm going to reorder and move the sum over j inside this infinite sum, which is perfectly legal because this is a sum of positive terms. And so this is equal to the sum over n, the sum over i, the sum over j of chi of those intersections. Now on the inside, since the ej's form a decomposition of A, this sum is nothing other than chi of EIN intersected with A. But the EINs are all in the ANs, which are all in A, and therefore this inside sum just becomes chi of EIN. And now we have the sum over i of chi of EIN, but the EINs have AN as their disjoint union, which means that this just becomes the sum over N of chi of AN. And there is the inequality we'd hoped to prove. Excellent. So now we have all the tools we need to prove that the Stilch's finitely additive measures are actually premeasures under the condition that the function is right continuous. Here's how we proceed. We need to show by the last proposition that if we decompose any half open interval into a countable disjoint union of half open intervals, then the Stilch's finitely additive measure of this is less than or equal to the sum of the Stilch's finitely additive measures of those intervals. Since our function is right continuous, it's very tempting to say, you know, I can prove equality there because in this decomposition, I'll decompose this interval into that one, and then that one, and then that one, and that one, and that one, and so on down the line. And the left endpoints of those intervals will form a decreasing sequence. And by the right continuity of my function, I'm going to get the result that I want. And that is very wrong because this disjoint union does not need to be in a decreasing order of the left endpoint. It could be all over the place. You could have this piece and then a piece over here, and then this piece and then a piece over here. And there can be countably many accumulation points in this process, as long as you get the full half open interval in the end. 
we're not going to be able to control each step like that. So we have to think a little more abstractly. So let's proceed carefully to do this. Here's the approach that we're going to take. First, we're going to shrink the interval a little bit and move a small distance delta over. So we'll consider the interval from A plus delta up to B instead of from open A up to B. And I should mention that for the sake of clarity, we're going to assume that both B and A are finite in this example, with the caveat that the proof we're going to present here can be modified trivially to work in the cases where either of them are actually infinite. The benefit of shrinking the interval a little bit like this is that now when we deal with the large interval from a plus delta up to b closed, this is a compact interval. So we can use compactness to reduce countable covers to finite covers. So note that this is of course contained in the bigger half open interval, which as we have noted above, is the disjoint union of these smaller half open intervals. Compactness is about open covers, not half open covers. So we're going to need an open cover. And the way we'll achieve that is to enlarge the interval from AJ up to BJ. We'll move the BJ a little bit over to a BJ plus delta J, where we choose the delta J small enough so that it's still less than B, unless we happen to be at that endpoint, but that's only going to happen once, so we don't need to worry about it. Now, these open intervals contain the half open intervals. And so this disjoint union is contained in the no longer disjoint union of AJ up to BJ plus delta J. And now we have a countable union of open sets containing this compact set. And by the definition of compactness, it follows that there exists some finite n such that that compact interval is actually contained in the union of the first n. That's great because chi f is a finitely additive measure. And in particular, by what we proved in lecture 2.1, it is finitely subadditive over unions, be they disjoint or not. So we can therefore take the half open interval from A plus delta up to B and note that its value under chi F is less than or equal to the sum of chi F of AJ up to BJ plus delta J closed. And the reason we can do that in order to match up the set so they are all half open where chi F lives is by noting that this union of open intervals is contained in the bigger union of half open intervals, throwing in the right endpoint. Now, Let's get rid of this arbitrary finite n and note trivially that this sum is bounded above by the infinite sum that we're more interested in. We'd like to compare this to a sum of intervals simply from aj up to bj. We can use the finite additivity of the measure to do that by noting that the terms inside here can each be written as chi of the interval from aj up to bj plus chi of the interval from bj up to bj plus delta j. And so what we have is that something close, and we'll quantify how close in a moment, to the left-hand side we're interested in, 
chi of a plus delta up to b is less than or equal to the sum of what we want on the right hand side chi of the interval from aj up to bj plus the leftover bits chi of bj up to bj plus delta j. Now we need to do two things. We need to get rid of this delta and we need to get rid of this term. Notice that we have yet to use any continuity properties of the function f. So let's do so now. By definition, chi f over here is f at b minus f at a plus delta. Notice that the right-hand side is independent of delta. So we're now going to take the limit as delta decreases to zero. Because the function f is right continuous, when delta decreases to zero, this left-hand side converges to f at b minus f at a, which is chi f at the interval from a up to b, as we're interested in. And since the right-hand side is independent of delta by the squeeze theorem, we get that this quantity is less than or equal to what we have on the right-hand side here. What we want to prove is that it's less than or equal to that. We've proved that it's less than or equal to that plus this leftover bit. How big is that leftover bit? Well, we have a fair bit of control here. We can choose those delta j's however we want, as small as we like. And so, we will again use the right continuity of the function to do so. Let's fix any epsilon greater than zero. And therefore, we can choose the delta j such that f at bj plus delta j minus f at bj, which is what this is, is less than, let's say, epsilon over 2 to the j. By doing so, we get that this whole sum is less than the sum, j going from 1 up to infinity, of epsilon over 2 to the j, which is epsilon. And so we haven't quite proved yet exactly what we wanted. We proved that chi f of a b is less than or equal to the sum of chi f on the pieces plus epsilon. But we proved that for any epsilon, and therefore it follows that this is actually less than or equal to that, concluding the proof. So we have now successfully constructed the Stilch's premeasures on the Borel field. Chief among them is the one generated by the non-decreasing right continuous function f at x equals x. For that function, the measure of an interval from a up to b is the length of that interval, b minus a. This will be the Lebesgue measure that we are principally interested in constructing as it will give us the uniform probability measures on the real line. It's important because it has an invariance property analogous to the one we started this course trying to construct on the circle and failing because of our purview of events having to be all possible subsets. The Lebesgue premeasure is translation invariant, which is to say that if I take any set that can be measured by it, namely a disjoint union of half open intervals, and if I translate that set, meaning that I move each of those intervals alpha units, then the premeasure of that translated set doesn't change. Indeed, from the definition, this will be the sum of chi of the interval from aj plus alpha up to bj plus alpha, which is the sum of 
bj plus alpha minus aj plus alpha. And of course, those alphas simply cancel, giving us the sum of bj minus aj, which is the sum of chi of aj up to bj, which is chi of e. This is why Lebesgue measure is important, and we will use this translation invariance many times in the future. But note that we have thus far only defined this pre-measure on the field generated by half-open intervals. Our goal is to extend this pre-measure and all of the pre-measures we've now successfully constructed to sigma fields so that they are genuine measures. We now turn to the goal of measure extensions.